So hi, my name is Charles and I'm from Singtel and I'm currently posted at NCS doing uh, robotics uh, with Joe and Kohan. So uh, disclaimer, I'm no expert in HRI. It's a field that I just picked up recently and I have been discovering uh, more and more about HRI through various conferences I've attended and through our work at NCS on robotics. So uh, just to get a definition of uh, HRI, what is human-robot interaction? So it's a field of study dedicated to the understanding, uh, designing, and evaluating robotic systems that are to be used by and with humans. So this definition has been adopted by the human-robot interaction research community worldwide, and it's developed by Godrich, who is like known as the father of HRI. So why is HRI important to us, and why do we need to understand the importance of HRI? So as you can see, like Singapore has been adopting more and more robots and all of us here are working on some cool robots that we want to deploy and they're going to be used by humans or with humans in certain environments. But these robots right, have a tendency to fail. Uh, they don't deliver the task they're supposed to or they don't achieve what they were set out to do, such as the robots that are shown here. So all these robots uh, had great tech and everything but they failed to uh, interact with the humans and that's why uh, we need to understand like what is the importance and how do we design these interactions. So just look at this one robot that has been deployed in Bangkok. It, it looks really scary uh, and it's in a hospital setting. So can you imagine this robotic nurse going around and trying to deliver stuff to you at night? Uh, and at the same time, there are uh, Pepper. I'm pretty sure everyone here is very familiar with Pepper. Pepper has also been deployed in hospitals. And these two robots, right, have been developed by great engineers, but they don't deliver uh, the same kind of outcome that is required. So this robot uh, brings out a very scary persona, and it's very hard for people to uh, be OK with seeing these kind of robots. But at the same time, Pepper is cute, and it's like, adopted as the definition of a cute and cuddly nice robot. So this difference right, is developed because of the difference in the kind of interactions they are trying to derive and the kind of functionality they are trying to focus on. So HRI, right, if I try to put it very, very simply, it's an extension of UI UX. So everyone is very, very familiar with uh, what is UI UX. So HRI is the same thing for robots, for bigger hardware systems and more complex software systems. So uh, as you all know, that because of UI UX, a, a particular phone can like, uh, outsell in the market, but at the same time, and another phone can like, just be lost and non-existent in the market. So if we break it down, right? Oh, the colors are quite bad. Uh, there's supposed to be circles here. So HRI right, is really three different parts. They're humans, they're robots, and they're interactions. So all these three different parts right, have different kind of researchers and different kind of complexities. So for humans, they are social scientists, they are people who understand psychology. Those are the people involved to understand how human behaves and react to different kind of scenarios. For robots, they are engineers like us who are working on developing robots and uh, coding, or uh, mechanical engineers designing it, and electrical engineers, all different kinds of engineers. And for interaction, they are linguists, they're communication experts. All these people who are working on trying to see what kind of interaction should the robot have with humans. So just to get a bit of uh, taxonomy, like words that are used by the HRI community. So the task type, what is the task? So the two robots we saw just now, the one that are deployed in hospital. So one of the robot's task is to simply deliver items. It does not interact with the users in any other way. Whereas Pepper is involved in like interacting, uh, answering questions, and also uh, entertaining task criticality. Like whether the task that you're getting the robot to do, what kind of task is it? Is it like of a very high importance? Is it very uh, medium risk or is it low risk? And uh, robot teams, so there are different kinds of robots that you can deploy. Uh, homogeneous robots means all the, all the robots that are being deployed are all uh, same, but if it's a heterogeneous, it can be like uh, one robotic uh, vehicle with another drone or something. And uh, there are level, different levels of shared information between the robots. So there are different kinds of interactions that you can design. 
So there can be uh, a singular interaction or there can be multiple interactions between a human and a group of robots. And uh, when we design our robotic system, we have to factor in which are the kind of uh, interaction that we are designing. Because every interaction that we design will have a different implications on the kind of uh, outcome we achieve. So for this interaction, right, one of the most important thing is how do we exchange information between the user and the robot. So there are three main types. So there is visual, such as uh, virtual reality, uh, graphic user interface, lights, projections, and gestures. So I will show a bit of examples on that. But all these different gestures, when you deploy in your robot, it, it has a very different uh, outcome. So if, for example, if you are trying to use gestures, so your robot has to be smart enough to be able to identify different kind of gestures. And at the same time, it needs to have the VA capabilities to be able to process it. Then if you use projections, then you need to be aware about the kind of settings and surroundings you are deploying the robot in. And uh, the second one is sound. So for sound, we have natural language processing. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so what kind of uh, information? Are you going to have the robot understand everything that the uh, humans are going to say? And if they are, then what kind of languages do you want to be able to accept? The last one is touch. So what kind of uh, interface you're going to build? Like, are you going to have touch screens, which is very common nowadays? Or are you going to have uh, input via a keyboard? So over here, right, you can see that for the kind of interaction that this uh, group is designing, they are getting a drone to interact with a human. So this is a research that is done by Stanford University. <coughs> Uh, so all the examples I show right, are not my research work. It's what I've learned from uh, the IEEE HRI conference in Korea uh, this year. So you're able to see that he's using gestures and projection to control. So over here, right, they're using like very, very simple gestures, which we all are very familiar with, compared to uh, having an app to control and interact with the robotic system, which is a drone in this case. <coughs> the next section of uh, HRI is expressivity. So there are three main segments in it. Is the eyes of the robot, the sound of the robot, and the degree of freedoms in the robot. So for the eyes of the robot, right, according to research, you can get 43.4% of attention of the uh, human who is interacting just by using eyes. Because whenever we look at robots, right, we are trying to uh, visualize social robots as humans. And as humans, when we are interacting, we like to have eye contact. So uh, if your robot has eyes, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> if your robot has eyes, then those eyes need to be able to communicate the intent of the communication and uh, what is its emotional state at that point in time. Then if your robot is using sound, then those sound uh, brings out the identity of the robot it brings out the kind of cultural context you want to have for the robot, and at the same time, what kind of gender you're associating the robot to. So apart from the looks of the robot, you will also have the, the gender that is communicated via the sound. You can use synthetic sound, you can use pro, uh, processed sound, or you can use actual sound like, like our own sound. And the last one is degree of freedom. So for different degrees of freedom, right, it communicates different intent. So uh, uh, based on the research that has been done by different groups, uh, it has been found that like, if you need to have at least three degrees of freedom for robot head to be able to gain the trust of the human. Because uh, as, as a person who is interacting with a robot, we usually tend to shake our head or we try to uh, nod in response when someone is talking. So over here, there is a, a Haru robot from Honda. It, ha it communicates purely just by eyes. And, uh, this paper can be found very easily online. It's an IEEE paper. <coughs> so the eyes are able to, uh, people are able to correct, 
really guess what is the intent they are trying to communicate and what is the emotional state of the robot at any point in time just by looking at the eyes and by using the degree of freedom that has been incorporated. So we're here I'm going to show like how for expressivity, right? this research that was done by MIT Media Lab that they are using a different kind of prediction model uh, to get the child who is in the video to understand whether the robot is uh, with the human and understanding. So, so just look at the way the robot is uh, responding to every word that the uh, human is saying. So this robot was using a prediction model. So when before the speaker is about to say something, it tries to predict what is going to be the next few words and everything, and tries to respond. So, and now I'm going to show you a very uh, simple sig signaling robot. So you you can try to spot the difference. Here we got. Here we got. Um, so there's a. Uh, there's a robot. Here we got. Yeah, so these two different uh, robots, right, they, they try to express uh, using the same three things I mentioned earlier, which is the sound, eyes, and degree of freedom. But you're able to see that there's a difference in the one that is able to predict and uh, able to respond uh, differently compared to the one. So uh, this research was done with about 14 kids, and it was found that most of them preferred this robot as it was able to respond more naturally like a human. So the next part right, is uh, navigation. So most of the robots move around. So the, the part about social navigation, right? that as us humans, right, uh, when we drive cars, we communicate our intent, what is going to be our next move very, very clearly, uh, unless you're driving in a country that doesn't really use signals. But most of the developed countries, we try to communicate using signals. So the same way for a robot, it should signal very, very clearly that what is going to be its next move. Because no one likes to live with the ambiguity of predicting how the robot is going to move, especially in a crowded environment. Then the autonomy commitment. So uh, robots can have different uh, percentage of autonomy. It can be zero where it's teleoperated, or it can be 100% where it's fully autonomous. So in this entire scale, right, you, sh you should be able to clearly identify where you are positioning your robot at, and that should be communicated by the robot's navigation. So people are able to understand what how the robot is going to move. And lastly is the robot speed. So the robot speed is very, very critical in trying to communicate uh, with the person uh, of what kind of uh, ambience uh, you're trying to create. So if you see the next video, right? Uh, So the robot is trying to approach a person who is moving uh, in a restricted area. So they try different speeds. So over here they tested with uh, people who are like using phones in a mall space and the robot tries to approach. But when, uh, when the, at the same time, right, they increase the speed and make it approach the uh, subject head on, right, it creates an impact. <coughs> <coughs> so that's like how you uh, integrate the navigation and communication within your robot uh, using social navigation. Uh, the, the last aspect is how you uh, do the design intent communication in your mechanical design. So uh, every robot will have a neutral pose when it's resting, when it's not performing a task. 
So in that, that resting pose, right, what is the kind of uh, communication you want to have with the robot? So why is the robot going to communicate and share? Like, is it a very strict robot? Is it a very friendly robot? So if you look at the two robots that were deployed in the hospital, the one in the Thai hospital, it looks very, very uh, scary. It has big red eyes and it has a yellow vest. But the Pepper robot, it has very cute and it has a very approachable feeling. So that is the design intent that is communicated. The communication mode is also uh, critical in whenever you are designing a robot. So whether you want your robot's communication to be with the hands, so the robot will have hands to do gestures or to communicate with the human, or you're going to have uh, uh, eyes, or you're going to use the voice. So uh, this needs to be also clearly identified, because as humans, right, we use all our different parts in trying to communicate. But for a robot, it has to be, you have to prioritize, because there can be some technological limitations. So the robot design also, there is this uh, uncanny valley diagram that we see. Uh, so humanoid robots are the kind of robots uh, like Pepper, but at the same time, they are like, uh, when you try to make the robot look more and more like a real person, it, it actually gets more and more scary and you can fall into this valley where people actually don't find themselves familiar with the robot and they don't find it approachable. Yep. So that's it from me. Uh, you all can try to read more about HRI via the conference and IEEE. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> Do you guys have any questions? I'm not an expert, but I can try to answer based on my knowledge. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. Unless you were to go No, no. So, like, if you. Like how, how would you choose which kind of uh, interaction to, to use like for depending like does it depend on the application does it depend on the target audience like so, how would you choose? so it depends on both the target audience because uh, you have to see like who is your target audience and what is their most comfort zone like how do, would they like to communicate so if you're using kids then uh, for kids right they probably want something that is uh, more cute and uh, they can they can rely on uh, but if you are, you are trying to deal with, uh, say, elderly patients, then you will have to probably pick something that is very, very clear for them to understand. Yeah. And uh, also about what is the application. So if your robot is meant to, say, uh, pick up things and place somewhere, then you will definitely need to have the main mode of communication via hand because uh, it will be more obvious via the gestures that is going to pick up something. But that can be accompanied with like sound where it can annotate all the actions it's going to do. So sometimes robots uh, perform actions that people are not expecting. And that's where the fear of robot comes and that uh, mismatch of trust. So to, to avoid that, right, robots can annotate all the actions. So all the communication methods, right, they can't, they don't, generally they are not used in singularity. They have overlapping uh, use. Just that uh, for one of the application, there'll be one that is predominant. So, like, so is that like, do you <coughs> think what's already existing in the market, or is there like, like some literature like, to help you choose, or like some scientific like, literature? Or uh, so, there is a lot of research that has been done, but in a local Singapore context, there is a very little research that has been actually been going on in HRI. So, because uh, it involves humans, and each uh, society and each cultural aspect of humans have a different kind of uh, response. So that's why uh, if, you, if you use the existing literature, a lot of research is done in Japan, uh, in uh, Europe and US. So if you use those, right, there might be a mismatch when we try to apply it uh, straight on in Singapore context. Because of different culture? Or? Different culture and different kind of expectations. Because over here in Singapore also, we have different kind of expectations from people. But when you go overseas, uh, people have different kind of expectations when we are interacting. And that's why for HRI, right, you need to have all the different kind of research uh, groups come together and collaborate. Yeah. Uh, okay, last question, which is about the last part of the presentation. Like, you know, when you show this, this thing, they're also like, very familiar to me that is when a robot is just in that zone that it kind of looks like a person, but not quite, it's like very creepy, right? Uh, so, like, do you personally believe that, like, the future of robotics is in overcoming that and, like, and having them in the like, perfectly human or in just 
staying before, so it's like staying in the valley where they're clearly not human, but like somewhat relatable. But so as of now, right, there is a preference for humanoid robots com uh, compared to actual uh, real healthy person uh, like, like Sophia robot. So people still tend to prefer like Pepper uh, compared to Sophia because uh, they don't want, they, when, when it's a human like, right, the expectation is completely different uh, compared to when it's a human eye because you're still like, this is a robot. But when it looks like a person, you have more expectations. And to be able to meet those expectations gets harder. But like, so uh, you as, as a person, you know, it's got a lot of reading on the topic, like, do you believe, let's say, you know, in 10 or 20 years time, the future is in staying in, this, in those robots or in trying to get them as human eye as possible so we overcome this? I, I think uh, in the time to come, we'll definitely overcome the valley. Uh, with the developments in technology and everything. And uh, one of the major players will be AI. Uh, how are you able to predict uh, uh, what the person is going to say or person is going to do? So when, when you're able to predict, you're able to communicate better. Yeah. Yeah, so good presentation. I think it's a really good overview of, of the topic in general. I think um, <coughs> a lot of the presentation was geared toward making it the robot approachable, but the same is true the opposite direction, right? Sometimes so you actually want to design it intentionally to, to put off some warning signs, right? Yes. Um, and then if you're interested in this topic in particular, there's a in UC Santa Cruz they just started a pretty big program on this. Um, Leila Takayama is the, is the professor and researcher there that's doing a lot of research on human robot interaction. She's, her whole career has been about that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Charles.